Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm looking a bit wet again. Um, coming out of my shower. <laughs> um, okay. So, hi, we are here to talk. Hello, Donalds, thanks, thanks for joining. We are here to talk about gaming and esports um, just now. Let me just um, um, put YouTube live just uh, in progress. So this live webinar is recorded and um, um, we will uh, in due course uh, prepare a, um, an edited replay version for those of you who want to uh, watch it in replay. Okay, so I'm trying to see whether we are live now. So um, oh, I'm in London and there's been a lot of rain just going on just, just now. So if you hear um, a lot of noises due to, um, you know, like, um, uh, rain, rain, and the thunderstorms and stuff like that. It's it, it, it's it's kind of uh, normal. It's just because it's been raining a lot uh, this afternoon. Thank God for the rain, as they say. Okay, let's get cracking. We are live on um, on uh, on YouTube as as well. I see. So let's let's get uh, let's get going. Okay, so the first point that I wanted to address today is um, what's going on in the gaming and esports industry at the moment. Well, the gaming industry has grown from a market valued at 198. Point forty billion US dollars last year in 2021. And we expect it to grow to reach a value of 339 and, uh, uh, and 95 US uh, uh, billion dollars by 2027. So that would be a compound annual growth rate of around 10% over 2022 uh, to 2027. So uh, pretty impressive, nice margins, as they say. And um, so in addition, so this year, because a lot of people are no longer in lockdowns, there's been in 2022, there's been a, a bit of a, of a slurp, like a, a slowdown in the activity of gaming and esports because people want to go back to socializing in person. They want to be able to go and uh, do sports or social events. So in 2022, uh, there's been a little bit of a slowdown, but all um, uh, analysts are uh, banking on the fact that the gaming industry is, as I said, going to grow on average um 10 percent year on year up until 2027 and in fact quite a lot of um large big tech companies are definitely uh banking on that and um, and um uh, betting on this and for example microsoft the um uh, uh software and hardware uh, giant has acquired in 2021, the uh, American video game holding company called Activision Blizzard for $75 billion. I read two days ago that actually this um, acquisition is subject to um, review from the uh, competition authority in the US, but I doubt that it's not going to go through. So yeah, Activision Blizzard, one of the biggest uh, um, gaming company is 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 being acquired by Microsoft, and um, in um, 
before that, it actually Microsoft had actually bought a game from Activision Blizzard, which is Minecraft, very famous game called Minecraft for $2.5 billion. So um, Microsoft is, is doing this. Meta, the parent company of Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, is also low, is also heavily investing into uh, gaming, and right now it plans to monetize Horizon Worlds, which is its uh, metaverse platform, uh, NFT store, and software marketplace. So it's called Horizon Worlds, and uh, Meta wants to actually monetize it with an aggressive forty seven point five percent commission rate on all in app purchases. So if you are a third party um, app uh, retailer and you want to sell your app through um, uh, Facebook and Meta's uh, platform Horizon Worlds, well, you will have to share the uh, profit with them, 47.5%. They'll take a cut of 47.5%, monstrous, enormous. So the margins are really great. Uh, so that's why big tech is definitely, you know, investing in um, in that as well, because the margins are just monstrous. monstrous. And then another uh, big, uh, you know, big tech media company, which is investing in uh, in gaming is Netflix. Netflix has actually made this interesting acquisition of a Finnish mobile games developer and studio focused on creating titles based on popular entertainment intellectual properties, such as the uh, series Stranger Things and the other series, The Walking Dead in 2022. So this Finnish mobile games developer is called Next Games, and Netflix actually paid $72 million for this acquisition. So at the moment, I understand that um, the, uh, uh, the games uh, of, uh, of uh, Net Games uh, uh, being, uh, is only used by 1% or 2% of Netflix users. Uh, but I do forecast that in the future, the more they're going to create games which relate to the series which are being uh, streamed on the, on Netflix, the more Netflix customers are also going to get into these games. So, massive growth, compounded in um, annual growth rate of 10% per year from now until 2030 or something, uh, big margins, Lots of big tech investing in uh, in gaming, but what's it all about? Well, today the um, uh, okay. So basically, the advances in cloud technology have allowed gamers, sorry, game developers, to rewrite code for different types of consoles and platforms, such as PlayStation, Xbox, and Windows PC, in order to incorporate such codes into a standalone product provided to gamers for a cloud platform. So gaming is also becoming way more democratized and uh, easy to use and less expensive because you don't have to buy, you know, the expensive uh, uh, hardware from PlayStation or Xbox or Win uh, if, to, to play so, such and such game. Now everything is on the cloud and you just, you know, have to open, a, sorry, a web page and you can actually play your game from there. So at max, you'll just have to invest into a... Um, you know, a, a, a sort of a gamer's mouse or, or also perhaps a, 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 a gamer's a, a keypad. And that's about it. And off you go, you start playing. So the um, hardware installation, uh, sorry, the hardware expensive to start being a proper gamer are also getting minimal because this cloud technology is really allowing uh, more and more people to, um, to get onto, onto the gaming world uh, and and um, uh, on board the gaming world without paying too much um, money for it. And also what is great with the cloud technology, it means that you can actually play in network with your, your gaming mates um, based in America, in France, in, uh, in, in Africa, in Asia, all at the same time, because everything is linked, you know, for these networks because it's all in the cloud. And, so this is what is really great, that these online video gaming platforms and great game creation systems such as Roblox and Fortnite, they allow gamers to play together in networks wherever they are based in the world. And gamers can even play games live to an audience. And yes, there is an audience for this. Lots of people are interested in watching 
gamers playing their games, you know, and they just go on um, popular video game live streaming platforms such as YouTube uh, Play and uh, Twitch. And um, these, these, these uh, audience members that just watch um, like super great gamers playing the games. So this fosters entire and creates entire streaming communities of gamers and viewers um, uh, who are built uh, via these streaming communities who interact together via shy, uh, sh chats, uh, via micro delivered messages on the platforms um, via social media. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that's also why big tech is really interested in investing in the gaming and um, uh, sector, because they know that there's going to be a sort of um, domino effect. Um, um, the um, more software is is going to be used by the gamers and the viewers of the gamers, then it's going to have a positive effect on social media. Then it's going to have a positive effect on e-commerce because then they will want the gamers will want to buy, you know, the the, the great the NFTs and uh, non fungible tokens NFTs, or they will want to buy also accessories uh, for their um, uh, their gaming avatars. And so you know, it's just like a ball rolling. The uh, uh, ability, the, the, the potential um, income streams, is a, 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 the potential of income stream is endless because you can make money from social media, from the software, from the hardware, from uh, the e-commerce um, sale um, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, in 2015, there was a reported community of 1.99 billion uh, people that were considered to, to, to be active gamers, 1.99 billion people in 2015. And this number has grown and um, is, is, has reached 2.96 billion in 2021 worldwide. So as I said before, due to the, uh, 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 the uh, end of the lockdowns and uh, when we are now in a pre-pandemic world, so perhaps it's, it has stayed at this level of 2.96 billion in 2022, but it's, I think it's, you know, it's just almost certain that um, growth is going to resume the more uh, great games are going to be launched in the market, okay? And at the moment, a lot of I, um, IP and, uh, and investment are being poured to create even better games and uh, an even more exciting community, as I'm going to explain now. So, um, yeah, so this year in 2022, there's an expectation that the number of people who play digital games, whether via console or computer or mobile device, um, is going to go beyond 3 billion, 3 billion people. Uh, personally, I don't play games because I think it's quite addictive and um, I'm not particularly interested in addiction. But, you know, um, I may come to it one of these days, you know, if, if, I, if I watch a film which it was series which has great um, um, uh, characters in there and then um, a, a game and the world is created with those characters it's possible that even even me and on my age and stuff and with my gender I might, it might be at some point interested I don't really start at all so okay so that is what is happening in the gaming industry at the moment in terms of latest advances and trends in relation to esports and virtual sports so these advances matter because um, uh, because every uh, game developer um, tech company sees this as a, as a money generating machine. So what is the current state of play with respect to resolving disputes in the esports and virtual sports uh, sector and in the gaming industry in general? Okay, so now we are introducing this concept of uh, esports and virtual sports. So let's, uh, let's define this in a more precise manner. Um, so that um, everybody is on the same page. Well, so within the gaming sector, there is a uh, type and genre of games, which is um, going from strength to strength, which is called sports games, also called esports. So the E for esports comes from economic rather than electronic. And as a publisher, a gaming a game publisher, rewrites the rules of its games, supplies the essential technology, and ultimately decides on the existence of a sport as a whole. So that's why it's called 
e-sports, so economic sports. So sports games, to a degree, are self-defining. So they include games such as um, MLB The Show, which focuses on baseball. So that's for, I mean, our North American audiences. Um, and um, we also have another uh, sports game called the Madden series, which relates to American football. And of course, there's FIFA Online, which relates to um, what us Europeans call football, or in North America, you would call soccer. Um, and FIFA, I think, is probably one of the uh, most famous worldwide FIFA Online. And so um, as competitive video games continue to integrate into popular culture, global investors, consumer brands, media outlets, and consumers are all paying attention to the rising popularity of esports. And so in this year, there will be 29.6 million monthly esports viewers in the USA, for example, up 11.5% from 2021. So this is also pushed by the fact that esports are championed by mainstream celebrities and early esports investors also, such as Michael Jordan, who um, has invested in um, uh, Team Liquid's parent company, for example. Um, also Drake. Drake is um, a, uh, uh, a champion of uh, esports and um he what is he doing drake yeah he's basically just you know uh, uh, investing an undisclosed amount of money in uh, in the in sports organization 100 thieves so um so yeah he became with scooter brown he's uh he, the, the um the uh, hollywood manager represents stars like justin bieber and ariana grande um, so he became with uh, with Scooter Brown, co-owner of 100 Thieves, which um, has field esports team that compete in games like Call of Duty and League of Legends. So yes, yeah, so this is actually a thing which is which is quite interesting in the esports uh, sector, which is that basically there are some companies such as Face Clan, for example, or as I just mentioned just now, uh, 100 Thieves, which basically band together teams of esporters so esports athletes digital athletes and then they would just manage them like they would manage a team of f1 um athletes or footballers you see so um hence the drawing that i made for uh the article that i published on uh, called uh, gaming esports and dispute resolution a brave new world because uh, this is just basically showing a team of esporters uh, who apparently are uh, uh, sponsored by Red Bull, and uh, they are playing together in front of screens um, and um, and probably just uh, all working. So, yeah, it's it's, 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 it's I mean, these guys are professionals, so it's 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 work. It's work. They are all working towards you know winning as a team a game probably on Call of Duty or FIFA or et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is why esports is so popular because it really is like uh, the game, but played virtually. And, um, and therefore it fosters even more this community and this, this spirit of competitiveness um, that um, one usually finds in the, 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 um, the uh, realm of uh, physical sports. Now it's been retranscribed into the virtual world through esports and virtual uh, sports. So what are virtual sports, by the way? Well, virtual sports are um, sports which uh, require an element of, uh, of physical, uh, in the physical world. So the virtual, for an example of virtual sport is um, through the cycling game company called Zwift, Z-W-I-F-T, and they create these, um, these bikes, which are physical bikes which exist in the real world, and then they are going to um, link those bikes to their game, their Swift game, um, and um, and therefore there will be a simulation of a race on the Swift software, 
uh, which will happen while every player will be actually on his or her bike uh, in his or her premises, like home or office or whatever. And um, they will be biking, they will be cycling their bikes from the, uh, the uh, particular locations to play the game, to play into the competition. And therefore they will be monitored through the, um, uh, the data collected by the Zwift uh, bicycles that they have at their homes or uh, premises. And this will be retranscribed to the software. So this is what virtual sports is, as opposed to esports, which is usually played with uh, a gaming console, like a gaming and, uh, you know, with your hands, so to speak, um, for the moment. So um, other type of uh, virtual sports are, uh, there's been a collaboration, for example, in relation to virtual sports between um, the, Fédera so the Fédération Internationale de l'Automobile, so the um, car, International Federation, Federation Inter International Automobile, and Gran Turismo, the, the game uh, about racing called Gran Turismo from Polyphony Digital. And so, um, so yes, so this is the difference between esports and virtual sports. And they are definitely um, increasing uh, a, a lot. There's, uh, there's currently a, 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 um, an increase as well in this particular competitive um, subsector of the gaming industry, which which is esports as well as virtual sports, um, and so in relation to uh, now that we've clarified the definition of esports and virtual sports, um, how do these? What is the current state of play with respect to resolving disputes in the esports and virtual sports sector and in the gaming industry in general? Okay, okay. So first and foremost. We have to remember um, the dispute resolution process, which applies for sports disputes. Okay, so as some of you may be aware, the um, uh, sports dispute resolution system is actually really quite well developed. And it developed in parallel with the um, Olympic Committee um, efforts to create the Olympic Games, which were launched by the French man Pierre de Coubertin a long time ago. I can't exactly remember why, when. But um, in parallel to the Olympic Committee, the Committee Olympique launched by Pierre de Coubertin, there was a necessity as well to develop. Um, to develop a way to resolve disputes in relation to doping, in relation to disciplinary issues, in relation to um, you know breach of rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in the physical sports um, establishment reality, the uh, International Olympic Committee established in 1984 the Court of Arbitration for Sport, CAS, Tribunal International du Sport, um, which, which is based in, um, in Switzerland, in Neuchâtel, if I remember well. And it is actually, as far as sports arbitration and um, dispute resolution in the sports world is concerned, all these disputes are being looked at by the various courts um, and um, institutions of neutrals, arbitrators, uh, uh, from the uh, Court of Arbitration for Sports, CAS, okay, which was, as I said, set up by the International, International Olympic Committee in, uh, in 1984. So just to remind you a few cases which uh, made the news recently, there was uh, a decision handed down by um, an arbitral uh, uh, sentence handed down by CAS, by this Court of Arbitration for Sports, in relation to uh, Castel Semania, the um, um, athlete who uh, uh, basically contested the decision made by the Olympic Committee for her not to compete in the o Olympic Games, uh, quite recently, I think the ones in Japan and the one before that, because her level of testosterone is too high compared to what the Olympic Committee wants um, to find in female athletes who, complete, who compete um, as, as females, okay? 
So Castor Simania, I understand, has got a female has got female sexual organs, but um, um, apparently a level of testosterone, normal level of testosterone in a body, is much higher than what than the, the one a, 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 a female athlete would have. Uh, I think she was just born this this way, but it is what it is. So uh, according to the Olympic uh, International Olympic Committee. This means that it is not possible for her to compete as a female with, with other female athletes. Uh, and since she can't compete with males uh, in the male uh, competition, it means that she can't compete at all. So Casta Semania being a great uh, and an extremely talented uh, athlete, she of course uh, uh, escalated her dispute uh, to, the, to Cass which actually I think handed down a decision in uh, 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 not in her favor. I will in due course also um, uh, write an article and uh, do some research about that, but one step at a time. So this is an example of, uh, of one recent um, sports arbitration uh, decision that was dealt with by CAS. Okay, so now we know that for sports, uh, uh, for sports disputes, relating to disciplinary issues, doping, contractual issues also, contractual issues with sponsors, with teams, with managers, that goes to CAS in Neuchâtel in Switzerland. But what, ha what happens with esports and virtual sports? Well, that's one of the areas that I have been uh, looking at in my um, uh, recent uh, 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 article published last week on which I sent out a newsletter and that you can read um, um, should you decide to become a subscriber to um, our um, our annual plan, um, you can find this on the website. And for the moment, the esports and virtual sports sector are um, based, uh, uh, have a disputes managed through uh, commercial arbitration. So. As opposed to having the sports arbitration bodies, just CAS, looking at any disputes um, in the um, in the esports or virtual sports sector, for the moment, it's actually commercial uh, arbitration institutions that um, that uh, manage those disputes. So, as an example, I mentioned Activision Blizzard. Uh, earlier because it's being bought by Microsoft for the um, hefty fee of $72 billion, uh, I, I, if I remember well. Well, Activision has got a, um, has got a very famous game, Activision Blizzard, um, and, and whenever there is an issue, with its 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 um, esports athletes or their uh, uh, handlers, Activision Blizzard says, "Okay, we're going to um, apply the terms of a Blizzard International Dispute Resolution Policy, which you actually signed signed up to when you decided to become a gamer for my uh, my game." Um, and um, in this. Blizzard Internet Entertainment Dispute Resolution Policy, the um, institution which administers arbitration procedures on behalf of uh, uh, Activision Blizzard is JAMS. Okay, JAMS is uh, one of the two uh, top North American arbitration institutions with, uh, uh, with AAA, um, and um, and JAMS is uh, is actually. Um, administering arbitration procedures throughout the world um, on behalf of uh, Activision Blizzard. Okay, a lot of neutrals at Jams are ex judges from uh, the US. Not only, but a lot of them are. Um, I still haven't accepted me as a neutral yet, and I am very annoyed. And I made it clear to them. But anyway, one thing at a time, and I'm sure one day I will also become a Jams arbitrator. But um, having said that. Activision Blizzard is is the um, yeah sorry Jams is the, is the uh, arbitration institution that um, looks after all the um, arbitration issues the dispute resolution resol uh, issues that Activision Blizzard has, and what is quite interesting is that in terms of these disputes, 
you could have some disputes um, relating, for example, to doping or um, digital doping. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, there's been a case recently uh, relating to digital doping, which uh, I would like to mention. So it's very difficult to prove digital doping because due to its sophistication. Um, however, in certain instances, the, the case of digital doping is just so blatant, so obvious that um, uh, developers can uh, only uh, so swiftly and strongly, you know, uh, start a uh, dispute resolution procedure with the uh, with the doping players. So there's been, during the first edition of the British Cycling Swift Eracing Championships, so I mentioned earlier that Zwift was this company which was creating all these uh, e-bikes, these bikes which, were, which are linked to software, and then you can actually do all these competitions online while you are biking on your bike from your home or you know, or work or whatever, wherever you've got your bike store, then at the same time you compete online with uh, uh, other players who are around the world. Okay, so this is managed by Swift, and Swift has actually partnered up with the uh, British um, Association of um, of uh, uh, Cyclers, and they have created this British Cycling Swift e racing championships. And during the first edition uh, of these championships, the winner, Cameron Jeffers used an algorithm to record inconceivable performances on his connected bike. That's it, that's what it's called, a connected bike, Zwift connected bike. And Cameron um, led the game to believe that he could pedal more than 200 kilometer per day, okay? In his best days, pre-cancer, I suppose, Lance Armstrong, uh, the top uh, cyclist in the world, at the peak of his career, pedaled 177 kilometers per day. And Cameron Jeffers, with his crazy algorithm, pretended that he could actually pedal 200 kilometers per day. And that gave Jeffers an advantage, um, a, way, a way to unlock the use of a better virtual bike from Zwift. Okay, so uh, Jeffers just manipulated the, uh, the software like this through this uh, algorithm. And so, um, and so that's how he became he became a winner of the first uh, series of a uh, British Cyclist Drift e racing championships. So that matter went to arbitration because obviously it was pretty blatant that uh, Jeffers could not pedal two hundred kilometers per day. And um, British Cycling actually ruled that um, Jeffers uh, would be banned for manipulation of pre race data to gain an unfair advantage via in game equipment. And he only got a, a six month suspension and a, a fine of 250 uh, pounds sterling, which is around 280 euros, which is nothing. And it really is nothing because I compare this with another case uh, where uh, there was also a disciplinary dispute, which, uh, which, uh, as I explained before, is usually uh, managed through uh, gaming publishers using auto-regulation or uh, as well as these uh, uh, arbitration institutions. And, um, and um, uh, Tencent is the Chinese uh, uh, company, which is it's a, it's, a, it's a behemoth, Tencent is, is, is a Chinese behemoth in telecommunications. And among one of their assets, they have this um, game developer called Riot Games, famous game developer, okay? Which is basically, by the way, a, an American uh, company, but they acquired it. And so Riot Games now belongs to Tencent. So it's under a sort of Chinese rules, ruling system, which is, you know, communist pretty strong and uh, tough. And um, they, they, um, uh, tens right, right game, sorry, has got this really famous game called Leagues of Le Legions. And um, in they, uh, uh, you and use a license agreement, Riot Games uh, provides that any uh, doping or disciplinary or uh, contract breach issue is to be dealt with by. Um, the online dispute resolution from the European Union, um, which is in place for EU members, and um, the Singapore um, 
International Arbitration Committee for Southeast Asia and JAMS that I mentioned for the rest of the world, except in Brazil, okay? So in 2021, Riot Games owned by Chinese Tencent actually enforced its uh, disciplinary rules by permanently buying, permanently banning, sorry, permanently banning, not bu buying, uh, Vietnamese professional esports player Min Lok from its game League of Legends, following some comments uh, deemed offensive about COVID-19 made, made by Min Lok during a stream. So I think that Min Lok more or less said, oh, well, that's quite good, actually, that quite a lot of players in, on uh, League of Legends have got COVID because then it means that it's easier for me to win. Something along those lines, I think. And then it was permanently banned from League of Legends as well as any other games from Riot Games by Riot Games and, uh, and its uh, parent company, Tencent. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Jeffers uh, uh, got, uh, got it, I mean, got off the hook very lightly uh, with his 250 pounds uh, fine um, further to, the, uh, to, to his um, uh, digital doping on the British Cycling Zwift Eracing Championships. So um, coming back to my original point, which was what is the current state of play with, with respect to resolving disputes in the esports and virtual sports sectors and in the gaming industry in general? Well, at the moment, and unlike uh, physical games, the um, disputes are being managed and decided by auto-regulation and also by referring to the terms of the end user uh, uh, license agreements that any gamers has to sign before being able to play the game uh, over esports or the virtual sports. And, um, and um, these means of, uh, of uh, resolution are through commercial arbitration, which are uh, managed by these various bodies that I mentioned. So the either the CIAC in Singapore or JAMS uh, for the US, North America, the rest of the world, or the online dispute resolution system if uh, uh, the gamer is based in the European Union. Or uh, also I've seen, uh, yeah, the Hong Kong International Arbitration uh, Association as well uh, for some games, um, such as Fortnite. I think Fortnite, yeah, uses HKIC for... Uh, uh, to reserve contractual disputes with esports athletes and their eventual handlers. So um, um, there is the uh, Olympic Committee the, has, has started to actually speak to the sports federations around the world by saying, guys, you need now to think about how your um, various how the uh, virtual or uh, uh, software versions of your sports are going to be uh, are going to be uh, managed in terms of dispute resolution process. Um, it, 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 the the um, Olympic Committee is saying maybe now is the time to actually think um, of possibilities for future cooperation and engagement in relation to esports, you know, um, instead of thinking that sports and um, Olympic games are completely different from esports and virt virtual sports, perhaps now is the time to actually work together. Uh, that's what the um, International Olympic Committee has started to say to the, uh, to the sports federations, um, in particular during a 2018 esports forum, um, uh, which was attended by 150 representatives from the esports and gaming industry, the players, the publishers, the sponsors, as well as some sports athletes and other members. So, yeah, the IOC is encouraging uh, sports federations to consider how to govern electric and virtual forms of a sport and explore opportunities with gaming publishers. Why? Because they want the control over that. They want to have also a, 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 a vested interest into in, into this uh, into this um, these virtual forms of sports because there's a lot of money involved here, and so that's why um, in terms of the future of, of alternative dispute resolution in the esports and virtual sports, now it perhaps is maybe time to think of um, creating a. Um, uh, 
uh, a specialized panel uh, of esports arbitrators in um, uh, in, uh, in institutions such as JAMS, ICC, CIAC, and HKIAC, since they, in any case, they are already um, usually uh, designated through the end user license agreements of the gaming companies as, um, as the uh, arbitration institutions looking after the uh, gaming and esports dispute. Maybe it would be time now to actually create some specialized panels of esports arbitrators um, uh, who specialize in, in, in dealing with this kind of, uh, of disputes. Another potential avenue of um, uh, creating more sophisticated um, alternative dispute resolution process of esports and virtual sports uh, disputes could be to create a, a new arbitral institu institution for esports. Uh, conducting fully virtual proceedings based on the uh, on the CAS on the Court of uh, Arbitration for Sports ad hoc division model, that could be another alternative, another avenue. So time will tell how the uh, dispute resolution process of uh, virtual sports and um, esports um, disputes will uh, will um, uh, will evolve and. Uh, what we already know is that arbitration of esports and virtual sports is bound to grow exponentially in synergy with developments such as dispute resolution in the metaverse and in relation to cryptocurrencies as well. That's it from me on, uh, on, uh, ooh, on this topic. So sorry, uh, Joe, I just saw your, your message that you wanted to join. Um, if you have any questions, do let me know. I'm going to have a look at our live stream on YouTube. If you want to ask a question, go for it. You just can unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, okay, so on YouTube, we have um, Enzo. <clears throat> Sorry, Enzo, who is asking. Um, I've been banned from playing on uh, the Fortnite games because of um, some comments that I made during a, um, a Twitch uh, streamed uh, playing uh, gaming session. Uh, what can I do? Well, if it's your, um, if it's more than a hobby, if it's like, your job to be a uh, an esporter, a a gamer. I uh, think that indeed uh, being banned from uh, Fortnite, which has three or four esports games, which are top of the range in terms of esports um, and virtual sports games, is is not an option for you, Enzo. So of course you must react and. Um, I think that it's best if you send us at Krifovi, our law firm Krifovi, a, uh, an email, which we will, of course, treat confidentially and explain to us um, the, uh, the facts as to for why you've been uh, banned from the fort playing the Fortnite games, uh, what was the circumstances, whether you signed the end user license agreement from uh, Fortnite, and um, uh, we can double check you know, uh, whether they, if Fortnite followed the, uh, the due process in terms of uh, 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 taking this decision, before taking this decision of banning you. And also we can see whether there's any remedy to, uh, 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 and uh, that we could, uh, we could potentially uh, try to implement here for you to, uh, to resume your activity as a, as a, as a professional esporter. Um, if you are, um, if, if playing is and gaming is, is only a, a hobby for you, uh, maybe you want perhaps to actually move on to some other games with some other game developers, because uh, obviously, um, you know, if you uh, have to appoint an instructor lawyer on this matter with Fortnite, it's uh, going to cost you some legal fees. So you have to actually, you know, uh, weigh in as, as to whether it's worth um, spending some uh, money on legal fees to to actually defend your right to be playing as a, as an esporter on on Fortnite, um, which there would be more rational for in case you were a professional esporter. If it's only your hobby, if you're an amateur uh, gamer, 
uh, maybe the best would be for you to move on to uh, another game uh, with uh, with some uh, other uh, gaming uh, publishers. Okay, guys, thank you very much uh, for your presence and um, and your support. And uh, if you want more information, more in-depth information, again, as I said, do have a look at our article um, on gaming, esports, and dispute resolution, A Brave New World. Bye for now.